Um, welcome, Mabel and Mario. Um, it's so great to have you here. Um, I know this took a bit of work <laughs> coordinating all of our schedules, but um, finally, um, it's it's really fantastic to have you here discussing the uh, the exhibition at the you know the landmark exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art: um, Reconstructions, Blackness in America, Blackness in Architecture in America. Um, I guess. Uh, you know, I should mention I was the, the show closed uh, on Monday um, and I was there uh, on the last day, seeing it again for the third time. Um, and I was reminded by a friend there um, as to how much the exhibition was really trying to do. Uh, and and I, I have to say that I saw it again with uh, new eyes with that in mind, given the, uh, the, the context of the MoMA um, given the uh, the theme of reconstructions and given the fact that um, all of the 11 artists and architects involved um, are working from uh, small or solo practices, uh, et cetera. So I, I just want to, uh, I just want to say how amazing uh, I felt that it was that it, it has the impact uh, that it did. And, uh, and kind of ushered in for, we hope, right? <laughs> um, a new era of exhibitions at the MoMA. Um, we should mention that it is the first uh, group exhibition of black architects uh, ever held at the Museum of Modern Art since its opening in 1929. So how does it feel? How are you guys? <laughs> yeah, Mabel, do you want to take that one since you're you co, -co, co <laughs> <laughs> We can just speak conversation. It's really, it's no really started with, uh, I, I think, well, for, perhaps even before that, but Mabel wrote a brilliant essay uh, called Black, called White by Design, um, that is in the, uh, among others, uh, book. Um, that uh, that Momo put out a few years ago. So maybe I don't know if you want to talk about the genesis of the show and yeah, and maybe I don't know if it's too soon for reflection <laughs> since it's just closed. But well, no, we're definitely we're definitely going to reflect because we have a lot to talk about it. But there's a lot of questions, of course, I want to ask you, and yeah. and and one of which is obviously how the show began. But before we before we even get into that, I guess I want to mention that um, given the long lead up of, of research and dialogue. I believe you began discussions with the MoMA in 2017, um, given the long lead up uh, and, and uh, the formation of the Black Reconstruction uh, Collective, um, the formation of the, the advisory committee, et cetera. Um, I think that we can't really discuss the show without also discussing the dynamic of working with the Museum of Modern Art on such a, um, a landmark exhibition. So. Um, I just want to um, say that the, uh, you know, the New York Times um, mentions that the exhibition is um, kind of be begun from the standpoint of, you know, how do we construct blackness? Uh, but clearly there's a lot more um, at stake and there's a lot more to um, just arrive at the construction of blackness. Um, blackness in America obviously has to be supported. It has to be protected. Um, we have to constantly invent and reinvent uh, just to arrive at construction, let alone reconstruction. And so I know that all of that must have played into your thinking. Um, I also want to just mention, I think it's important to say that since its opening in 1929, uh, the Museum of Modern Art um, architecture and design department has collected no work uh, by black architects. Um, I think in 2016, uh, there are only, actually since 2016, there are only two works by black designers in the MoMA collection to date. Um, Charles Harrison's Viewmaster uh, and Amanda Williams' uh, Color Theory collection of photographs neither of which is specifically architecture. So, you know, just to kind of set the context for um, how important and, uh, you know, game changing this exhibition was. So Mabel, be, um, please tell us how, <laughs> tell us how all this began. 
I mean, I can, I can certainly say for me, it's really been 30 years. <laughs> and I'm, it's same for Mario. I mean, this has really shaped um, an intellectual journey, um, a journey of practice, um, of how you engage, um, the, how, how do you engage blackness in these disciplines and institutions in which we work, whether they be academic, uh, museal, um, professional, um, at every point you see absence, you see lack, um, uh, especially in, in design. And, and what I found in order to do this work, one, that collaboration is vital, um, that you have, because there's so much work to construct a history, a backstory to understanding black spatial practices, black space, what that would mean, because the primary sources that you would have engaged in in your own education would be completely negligent and absent. So there is this kind of sense of like, if you take on this question, it's not, it's not like you're going to be able to just, you know, go to you know space time and architecture gideons and and and, yeah. and find what you're looking for you, you you have to create it yourself and 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 that's really been a 30-year journal journey and and i think moma you know engaging an institution of that stature with its own absences i think as you rightly point out um you know shows the degree to which the presence of black designers and architects and thinkers are are absent from the canons that get passed on yeah. that shape our respective fields uh, and absolutely, it's only Charles Harrison and Amanda Williams that um, are now in the collection because they didn't have anything. And this was the premier first in the world collection of architecture and design ever yeah. established by Alfred Barr and, and Philip Johnson. And I think it's very telling yeah. about the whiteness of these fields. And my essay was called White by Design yeah. for a book called, among others, edited by Darby English and Charlotte Barat which took stock of blackness in the archive of MoMA, which didn't necessarily mean that you were a black artist, but that you were engaging in representations of black life, black space, blackness, and whatever that might mean. And they went through the archives and when they came to architecture and design, they got a big fat zero, except for Swatch of Fabric by Joel Robinson hmm. in the study collection who had been trained as an architect, but as he said in Ebony Magazine, couldn't get a job in the Lily White field of architecture. Also in my research, going through Gordon Kipping, um, our colleague at Columbia. Oh, and Gordon. Our, yeah, Gordon has a work in the um, study collection, which is also not in the main collection, even though it's been on view, I think now three times. So Melba, can you, can you explain the difference between, let's say, the study collection? Yeah, the study collection is, is, for, is specifically for that. They're objects for study, for scholars that may come in um, and be looking for something specific. They're a bit more accessible um, to scholars. Um, the main collection is for display, right? And it's actually the premiated one. And there are works that go from the study collection to the collection. Um, and I think the Robinson fabric is now in the collection, in the main collection. So, mm -hmm. and it, it has been on, on, on view. Um, but I was, I was shocked um, when I was asked to write this essay about why there was no one in the collection. And, you know, there had been, as far as I can tell, there were no black, you know, industrial designers or product designers or graphic designers shown at MoMA at all. I was shy. And I kept asking people like Michelle Washington, can you give me some names so I can go back and look? And I couldn't find anything. And the only black architects I could find that showed were Paul Revere Williams and Hilliard Robinson and Max Bond. That was in the 30s and Max Bond in the 70s and, and, and uh, Donald Ryder. And that was it until 2010 with small projects, big change with Francis Correa, 2011. Right. Of course, of course. So I'm uh, sorry, were you referring to Michelle Wilkinson at the uh, Smithsonian? No, huh. no, Michelle Washington, okay. who is a uh, design historian and, and critic. Okay, so I'm wondering um, the obvious uh, question, that, of course, the, the exhibition is co-curated with Sean Anderson, uh, who's a curator at the MoMA. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering uh, why the MoMA would go outside of its curatorial team 
uh, in a situation like this? I mean, you're explaining why, but I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in the process of that. Um, when Sean asked if I was, you know, that he, he, he wanted to do the show, he wanted to do the show before, you know, something that was engaging the history of anti-black racism in the built environment. And he thought that this would be appropriate topic for something I think it's called Contemporary Issues in Architecture, started by Barry Bergdahl. So there was Rising Currents, Foreclosed, right. and I always forget the show, Tactical Urbanism, that's the subtitle. Um, and so he thought this would be a great, great topic. And then on top of that, it was discovered that there were no black architects or designer in, in MoMA's collection. So that made it, I think, for Sean even more urgent. And when he approached, he said, either you could be in the show <laughs> or you could help curate. And then I thought, well, yeah, you're probably, it would be helpful to have maybe my experience and expertise on the curatorial side. And I had curated part of um, the Frank Lloyd Wright 150 year, looking at a Rosenwald school. So I had worked curatorially with MoMA before. And just thought it would be an interesting project to take on because it's something I don't typically do. Yeah, um, of course. So does yeah. MoMA actually have uh, black curators on its staff in, in architecture and design? No. There, there is Thomas Lacks in, in performance, um, and I, I'm sure there are others, but I'm completely blanking, uh, but not many. Yeah, of course, of course. So then um, once you were approached, um, can you tell us about the, uh, the formation of the committee? Um, why form a committee? And I'm, of course, reminded of, you know, the traditions in, in our history of organizing to kind of uh, make these points. I'm thinking of uh, Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells, of course, around the 1893 mm -hmm. uh, Columbian World Exposition. But I mean, can you tell me why or how you began to work on this idea of a committee? Yeah, I mean, it, part of it probably comes from just my own research on um, expositions and museums. Um, you know, my book Negro Building, and then I was commissioned by the African American Museum in DC to write. And a lot of those were very collaborative and collective oh. efforts, you know, including Booker T, you know, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Mary Church Dewell. I mean, just extraordinary list of people. But they were always collaborative. And I realized if we were going to work within MoMA, that clearly might have a little problem here in their architectural and design department, particularly in terms of what's legible and visible, that perhaps having a collective voice um, could give Sean and I more leverage in sort of pushing through the agenda of the show. Um, and so we formed an amazing advisory group that didn't necessarily include a lot of architects, but we knew people working in poetry were thinking about black space, writers, um, um, artists, um, you know, we had people like Christina Sharp or, you know, from the architect, we had, you know, Diane, Diane Harris, who's worked on whiteness in the built environment for years, Justin Moore, um, you know, Ifeoma Joma, um, Milton Kerr, you know, we had just brought in G uh, Jennifer Newsom, just a really, you know, kind of great group of people that we met with three times to really help us sift through Carla Shedd, who's a remarkable sociologist at, at the CUNY Graduate Center, you know, to help us sort of think through the kinds of issues, questions, and ways of framing the show mm -hmm. that not only could engage this institutional structure that we were gonna to have to work in, but also how would this be meaningful to a wider public? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were also just key in helping us define like what kind of contributors we, we wanted in the show. And, and, and that's how we sort of landed on people like Mario, for example. Yeah, of course. And I mean, um, this is a general question. So Mario, please feel free to jump in. But um, I guess uh, it, you know, many of these people in the committee then went on to contribute to uh, the catalog, the field guide, as it were. So it should be mentioned that the project is much bigger than um, only the exhibition, uh, but um, I guess I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, when we think about uh, how uh, the MoMA has put on previous seminal seminal exhibitions, like I'm thinking of uh, Modern Architecture from uh, when was it? Maybe will help me. 1933, uh, is that right? Oh, the original. The original yeah, Modern yeah, Architecture Mo exhibition. It's international. Yeah, the, I forgot. Which, the, which, which oh, essentially yeah. introduced. Uh, the international style to America. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking of the 1988 Deconstructivist Architecture Show, 
um, which once again introduced a new movement uh, in architecture to America. Um, neither of these exhibitions, however, uh, attempted to combine um, uh, a kind of historical framework with contemporary practice. Uh, and so, you know, I'm wondering, and this is a very big question, but, but given the fact that, you know, the exhibition is the first time uh, there is an exhibition of, of Black architects and artists, and on top of that, we have this very uh, weighty uh, topic in which to engage in, um, you know, do you feel that um, we always have to kind of address Blackness before we can actually address our own work individually? Mario, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, particularly with, um, with this exhibition, um, you know, the, the curio curatorial team really strategize and set it up as a, let's say, a transdisciplinary um, uh, investigation, if you will. Um, so unlike the, the two shows that you mentioned, the International Style Show and the Deconstructivist Architecture Show, this show is not simply about the, the discipline of architecture. It doesn't uh, confine itself to, uh, to those strictures of aesthetics and, and form making, but to larger social, cultural, race, uh, critical race theory, questions of critical race theory. So, um, and, I, and I think the advisory uh, committee that Mabel uh, mentioned, you know, also including um, people like um, Zadia Hartman and Tina Kemp, who are two people that uh, on the first day when the 10 artists and architects who were working on the 10 different cities were brought in to meet with the, the curators. We actually had a day long workshop with uh, presentations and discussions with Tina and Sadia, and it was actually mind blowing. So for most of us, what we thought we might be doing initially just kind of totally changed because we realized that it was a much different and a much larger conversation than let's say thinking about, you know, the way that architects and designers usually think, which is about the making of the object and the making right. of the thing. And uh, this required a much broader sort of examination of, uh, of blackness and spatiality than, um, than architecture you know, allows, than the, than the discipline allows. But hopefully now that you know, the discipline can be ex uh, expanded um, you know, to these discursive spaces and not only about um, what uh, you know, the professionals tend to think of as being architecture. Absolutely. And I think, thank you, Mario, for that, that uh, very um, direct uh, and clear uh, explanation, because I think that that establishes that, you know, how, how much more difficult um, the, the, the task was, right? Not only entering the moment for the first time, but then also dealing with these topics. And of course, it, it all cannot be taken out of context. Um, given our own uh, ongoing struggle for racial equity in America um, and the, the number of um, horrific events that continue to happen uh, on a daily basis where yeah. you know, the idea of, of black bodies in public space and, and safety just, uh, you know, don't go hand in hand, so. Yeah, and, and I just wanna add, I mean, I, I'm part of a, um, a collective with both Saidia, that, that Saidia Hartman and Tina Camp started called Practicing Refusal that included Christina Sharp, who is also on our advisory group. And um, Saidia's work in particular, you know, writes about like the violence of the archive, the violence that's engendered in the archive. And I, and I think that's true. The exclusion of black creatives from the MoMA archive is, 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 is a continu continuation of the kind of violence. Like it isn't just police violence against black bodies. It is a constant, every millisecond moment of violence that diminishes your life. And you find that violence in archives, the fact that you're excluded from it. You have, may have no name from it. There's no record for you from it. Um, you know, when they built the African-American Museum, when Lonnie Bunch started that project, which is a hundred year effort to do that, 
they didn't build a museum, they also had to build the archive because the Smithsonian said, well, black people didn't have anything worth collecting, right? And, and MoMA continued that, you know, that, that tradition, right? Even though it was a said modern institution, not a 19th century one like Smithsonian, but a modern one that didn't collect work in architecture and design um, by black people. And that exclusion is a form of violence. And so then when you enter an institution to a show like this, there's nothing there in the archive, right? So for us, that advisory group was a kind of human archive in order to draw from to do that work, right? To do the curatorial work. Um, yeah, and, and, and that was a, it was a, certainly a different way of working for MoMA, but I'm very familiar with having to be, um, uh, uh, having to be very inventive with how one as a historian goes about doing uh, arch archival work because there's no evidence, because you weren't uh human. And you weren't worth, you know, historicizing. Yeah, and even even in this this day and age where we assume that, well, I mean, there's this uh, this kind of um, post racialism uh, that we're striving for. Obviously, we're not there. I'm I'm not uh, not saying that we are there, but I think it's so important, Mabel, that you mention um, that there's this ongoing intellectual violence. Um, that we as Black creatives have to resist, right? have to uh, fight against and have to kind of negotiate, um, not just in the, in the museum, but in academia, um, in professional life, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that those, um, what's fantastic about the exhibition is that it presents such a diversity of responses to that. So, um, yeah. Please, I guess I guess it's a good moment for us to jump into uh, into the show. Um, let's continue with uh, with some images as well, and we can. I mean, obviously, I'll um, I'll continue to ask questions, and I'd I'd love to hear more about the Black Reconstruction Collective as we go along. Can folks see that? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, great. <laughs> Don't usually use PowerPoint for a reason. <laughs> yeah, and that question of the archive, you know, I'd like to, you know, maybe think about this show as a kind of counter archive, right, in, in the institution of MoMA. Um, and hold on, this is going to drive me crazy. Uh, sorry, I'm getting these, yeah, <laughs> these things on my screen that I don't want. Um, this is a really great quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, the activist, historian, sociologist, founder of the NAACP, who really wrote a magisterial work called Reconst Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. And that, that was that moment of promise when enslaved people, freed people, had finally been granted citizenship. And I thought it was very telling that he said, the story of transplanting millions of Africans to the New World and of their bondage for four centuries is a fascinating one. Particularly interesting for students of human culture is the sudden freeing of these black folk in the 19th century and the attempt through them to reconstruct the basis of American democracy from 1860 to 1880, right? You know, and it, it says the stakes, right? of the project of the nation and what it would mean to include peoples of African descent as full citizens and to have full rights. And then, of course, we know it fails because Jim Crow segregation sets in to reassure the inequities um, that, that existed under slavery were just recalibrated under Jim Crow. We had civil rights and 50 years later, we we're, we're seeing how Again, those inequities were, were, were recalibrated. But I love this, this photograph of the exodusters um, who were you know, blacks who had fleed either into Indian territory prior to the Civil War, just after, who just wanted to make their own spaces, their own communities. They wanted to be liberated, live freely. You know? and, and I love the way you know, these men and women, the way they're dressed, their clothes, they have horses, they've made homes, they own land, they, right? So here they are participating 
in the American uh, in the American dream. Hmm. And it's... Mario, do you want to say anything? Sorry, my for some reason my my uh, you guys are all frozen, but as long as you can hear me, that's we fine. Can, we can yeah. hear you. We're not sure if you can advance the slides, but but we can hear you and we can still see the image. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Mario. Yeah, I was just going to say that the um, the, the ten uh, of us who are the architects and designers are, are trained as architects. Um, as a result of coming together, uh, formed the uh, Black Reconstruction Collective, um, and this was really after our first meeting with uh, with Momo. We individually worked on our projects, but recognized that the resources that were um, being given to us weren't enough and that we wanted to form this collect collective as a kind of mutual aid society, I suppose, if you will. Um, and this image of the, of the Exodusters, um, this was one of the first images that we came upon, which, which was um, really important for us because it, it also spoke to the nature of uh, you know, of collective work, you know, of building community, if you will. Absolutely. Um, you know, so uh, last fall, as we were um, also preparing on the show, we uh, conducted a series of lectures or were invited to give a series of lectures at, at, uh, at different schools. And um, we continue to do research on the Exodusters and other um, freedmen, uh, freed persons, black, uh, black town or black cities, black towns, um, in the US, but this is one of those images that we came upon, which was, um, which really spoke to the, to the spirit of, uh, of the Black Reconstruction Collective. Yeah, and I, I guess I wanna add that um, it's important to, to note that these pre-Black settlements, historically speaking, became a kind of key element of the curatorial project um, in the exhibition. Um, Mario, you mentioned uh, that the funds that you were given from the MoMA weren't quite enough. Can you elaborate on that? Um, do you mean that each of the projects was commissioned and you were given a certain amount of money to produce uh, the work in the show? Yes, um, each of us uh, was given a certain amount of, uh, of funding from MoMA to produce the work, but of course the work uh, greatly or multiple by multiple times sort of exceeded um, that amount that we were we were given. But um, in addition to supporting uh, each other, um, we quickly realized that um, we want the Black Reconstruction Collective, which um, is actually now going forward as a 501c3, um, to also be able to support and to provide funds to other creatives who are doing the work of liberation and uh, doing similar kinds of work that, you know, that we're doing. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's important to know. And, and I'm wondering, Mabel, if, are you still with us, Mabel? I am, my computer froze. <laughs> so I can't advance the next slide. Okay. Um, I believe Mario has a copy. Yes, uh, I'll just pull it up. Give me one second and then I'll, I'll share my no screen. Worries. Uh, Mabel, while we wait for that, I wanted to ask you, um, Actually, can you, I may have to reboot my entire computer and log back on because I can't get out of um, power. Oh, I think, we, I think we just lost Mabel. Lost Mabel. <laughs> um, I'm sure she'll be joining us uh, back in a second. Mario, I was wondering um, if, the, uh, if the idea of commissions um, was something that came from the MoMA or, or something that developed uh, in the advisory board, advisory committee? That I do not, I, Mabel is probably better um, suited to, to answer that, but I assume that it came from MoMA because the, uh, I think this is the fourth of the issues in architecture series. You know, previously um, those architects or teams of designers were commissioned by, by MoMA. Okay. And was there ever any intention or expression by MoMA to collect the work that was produced? That is um, to be determined. <laughs> okay. Okay. It will be uh, acquired or not. Right. Okay. So um, 
just in the sake of time, uh, why don't we move on to the next image while Mabel rejoins? Sure, sure. Um, so in, initially, um, uh, uh, there were 10 artists and or 10 designers and architects um, trained as, as architects. Um, and each of us were asked to or was asked to select a city to work in and we're and this was a multi-scalar sort of project um, and you can see this chart which is part of the brief that we were given to think about uh, scales and types different kinds of spaces and again these are discursive spaces most architects perhaps don't do not necessarily think in these terms mm -hmm. and then specific sites um, uh, in the continental uh, United States um, to uh, to investigate um, this is a map of uh, that uh, for those of you who had an opportunity to visit um, the exhibition. This is a map of the continental United States in black are the uh, the 10 uh, cities um, that are included in the exhibition, but in uh, green are the multiple the numerous um, uh, black settlements and towns and cities. Um, in the United States. Now these settlements were free after reconstruction or even during reconstruction? These settlements were free after reconstruction, maybe, maybe yes, were free uh, during and after reconstruction. Okay, um, I'd just like to mention, uh, here's Mabel rejoining us, um, that although there were 10 uh, participants uh, trained in architecture, there's also the work of the artist David Hart, which was included in the exhibition. Um, yeah, that, that, that's right. And um, I think it was really brilliant that uh, the curators, Mabel and Sean, uh, invited David to, uh, to be a part of the exhibition. And Mabel, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about the, the way in which David's contribution relates to the overall show or related to the overall show. Yeah, no apologies. I knew I should have done a restart of my computer before opening that big file. <laughs> it just froze. Um, yeah, I think it was important precisely because we knew, just like with the advisory group, that the work was going to exceed the usual, um, you know, the usual characteristics of architecture, you know, that, that people were going to be pulling from poetry and literature and art and cinema and um, that it be important to also have a voice to amplify and to show that there are many ways of thinking and exploring um, uh, blackness uh, and particularly the built environment. And, and David's really, you know, remarkable work um, has done that for many years. He's been in dialogue with architects and spaces and uh, cities and landscapes through his work for 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 quite a while um and and so we thought it would be great to have his voice amongst the the works in the in the gallery of course and he's he's a principally a photographer and and a filmmaker um who's also had very um great proximity to uh projects around uh, historically african-american themes mm -hmm. as well yeah, he did a really great uh, installation um, at uh, Temple Beth uh, Shalom in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, which is a Frank Lloyd Wright synagogue that was quite poignant about migrations, thinking about diasporas, black diasporas, Jewish diasporas, and, um, and, and, and landscapes of movement. And uh, so he's a really remarkable and, and really generous artist, I think. So it brings up the question of would the Black Reconstruction Collective begin to invite uh, other practitioners into the cold at a certain point, because I don't believe David is part of the BRC. Um, ab absolutely. There are uh, 10 founding uh, members of the board of directors of the Black Reconstruction Collective. Uh, and uh, this is our, we're still within our first year. <laughs> um, and actually, we just had a retreat um, this past weekend um mapping out the you know the next year and the future for the for the brc but we do see the brc expanding in terms of its membership in terms of its board and uh also in terms of its advisory board um, for the future okay. 
So Mabel, I'm going to turn it back to you if you'd like to narrate us through the, the works in the show. Yeah. So the, the works um, occupy two spaces um, in, in the galleries on the third floor of, of MoMA. Um, and here we see Mario's work, um, uh, the space of refusal, uh, the refusal of space, sorry, um, that he'll, he'll talk a little bit more, I think, about um, at the end of this. But um, that previous image is actually on the, the wall um, in the gallery. I don't know if you explain that, Mario. Uh, yeah, the map. The map. Yes, it's, it's actually from the a secondary entrance near the elevator. So it was at the wall near the secondary entrance to the gallery. Yeah. One would see this as you see that map as you cross the bridge looking straight ahead. Yeah. And and it maps not only the projects of the the eleven contributors, but also the free black towns, the free towns that emerged, right? Um, and you know, so there are these very interesting multiple thresholds, right? A layerings of reading this kind of history, this, this, but also, you know, the fact that all these projects, they are projects, they're projective. So they're also imagining forward. Uh, next, please. Um, and so this is Amanda Williams work. We're not down there. We're over here, um, which is a, a beautiful uh, unfolding of um, black, liberatory space. Um, she uh, looked at the town of Kinloch, which was the first black town in, in Missouri after emancipation, um, founded by um, uh, free blacks and what that meant. Um, but she was also, you know, thinking about like, what is black space? What about the creativity that went into making that, you know, the patents that were made by these freed black people who tried to even get a patent for <laughs> black space. Um, and her spaceship vessel capsule, uh, which you see on the right on the blue wall, is made out of ice cream scoops and um, hot combs and um, uh, 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 various objects that were invented by black people. And it's a spaceship. We're not down there. We're over here. We're in our space of liberation um, and the capsule is taking off and then what you see projected are these kinds of a narration of black space but with um, beautiful historic documentary images of families that, that lived in Kinloch which is outside of St. Louis next to Ferguson, Missouri. And of course you know I spoke with Amanda um, here on Design and Dialogue um, not too long ago. I saw and, that. Yeah it was a really great conversation. I was struck by her um, her sense of duality. And I want to talk a little bit about that, like the idea that black space exists constantly here and there, <laughs> constantly um, accepted and refused, um, constantly loved, revered, and feared. Um, and, and I wonder if um, what you think about this idea of, of you know, Blackness being uh, always being filtered through uh, this kind of duality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the duality, you know, the condition of blackness, and I can talk about this a little bit more with Emmanuel uh, Amasu's work. You know, blackness is a condition of closure, right? Enclosure, right? Because the ways in which people became black, Africans in the Middle Passage became black, Negro, whatever, you know, in that. Right, they become racialized to become this fungible object that can be sold and traded. That's where the blackness comes from. It is a form of enclosure that then is spatialized in the plantation. It's spatialized in, in the ghetto, the favela, um, you know, various informal inf sites of informality and de you know degradation, spaces of degradation around, literally around the world. And yet, in those spaces, there is black social life. Right, there are imaginings of things that you know, that are liberatory, right? And, and, and I think, you know, Mario's, you know, refusal of space is a perfect example to refuse, you know, to think about what does it mean to refuse those conditions of containment and diminishment. And so, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Mario. Uh, no, no, I think we can move on, yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is, uh, you see both Amanda to the left, David Hart, who we were just talking about, this picture of Charles Burnett, 
in his work and um, Felicia Davis in, in the center. Uh, her work was engaging um, uh, uh, Pittsburgh and the Hill District. Um, that was a black community um, in Pittsburgh that was really devastated by urban renewal. Um, and Felicia was very interested on, in on the ways in which mutual aid, the ties that are often made between especially women who were doing quilting and sewing together, tried to knit together a social network that even after communities are dispersed, maintain and sustain themselves. And so uh, Felicia has a background in computational design, PhD in computational design. Her expertise is actually in textiles, uh, responsive textiles. And so this, what she calls the black rose is also an antenna and it's reactive to the bodies that are in the galleries. And you can hear, you know, the, the, the textile speaking as you enter into the, the gallery. I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful work. Uh, next please. And she's running the soft lab, is that correct? Um, at the... Yeah, I believe that's what it's called at Penn State. Oh, um, and here is David Hart on exactitude in science, which is a quote from Borges, Borges um, and about, ge about geography and what we can or we can't not know about a particular space. Uh, David is phenomenal and he fabricates these constructions, these ways of displaying um, his work um, and this piece, this is the filmmaker, Charles Burnett, whose famous work, Killer of Sheep, um, was really a meditation on um, uh, the black working class and Watts. And so this is a kind of return, a remembrance, of the kind of recursive relationship to history and place that, that one might have, where he engages in a remembering of, of Watts um, and the ways in which these spaces fade are literally pixelated into memory um, and it has a beautiful accompaniment by Tamika Reed, a really remarkable cellist. So David often works with musicians and filmmakers and um, on, on this work to really sort of capture these kind of layerings of space uh, in which Can it's add... not just flattened into Watts the ghetto. Yeah, and speaking of which, it's not just flattened into the exhibition wall either. And I wanted to ask about the positioning of this work in front of the windows. And, and was this a conscious choice by David or yourself in terms of the relationship of, of video to uh, the, the glass facade, the modernist glass facade and the city beyond? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was a conversation. I mean, it moved in several spaces to really find a good space to work. Um, and I think this window worked perfectly, precisely because of the very kind of minimalist um, uh, edge of the monitor, the support that David fabricated for it, and then the place of bench um, in, in, in front to really hear this amazing sound work and uh, narrative. Um, this is Yolanda Daniels, um, Black City to Los Angeles edition, uh, which is part of a continuing project that Yolanda has worked on um, around giving sort of definitions to what is a black city. Uh, this features um, several dictionary plates that define race, hmm. uh, that define, in, in, in this case, um, uh, uh, Califia, which I think was the name of California initially. Um, and, um, you know, one side on the left is the 19th century city and black settlement in that city and the story of a, a woman named Biddy Mason who actually bought a fairly large tract of land that she subdivided it for a black community there which has been sort of erased and forgotten. And then on the right, a kind of mid 20th century version, right? Where that community then snakes down North Central Avenue uh, and into South Central Avenue and into uh, what became known as South Central Los Angeles, right? And the narratives of the Dunbar Hotel and the, you know, where Duke Ellington would would stay because, you know, it remained a, a segregated a segregated landscape. Can you talk a bit about the uh, the freestanding sculptural? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so the model was was is one of of four actually that that Yolanda had imagined for the project that really kind of maps layer by layer by layer by layer different sites and in, 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 in histories of the city, right? That is, that's laminated together um, in that. I heard Yolanda speak um, 
quite poignantly <laughs> about uh, the idea that, you know, when entering the MoMA, um, the, the, the collective um, had this impression that the MoMA wanted through this exhibition, uh, the, the architects to solve the issues of race mm -hmm. or solve the issues of public housing or solve any kind of, uh, you know, urban issue that has to do with blackness. Yeah. And, and I wonder, um, you know, obviously that's quite limiting, right? To kind of project that uh, onto um, the artists and architects in the show. But then I wonder what, what exactly was the brief per se? I mean, if, if there was one and. Yeah, I mean, that slide, I think when my computer crash um, that we were gonna show was the brief. <laughs> I, I don't know if Mario, you can sort of go back. No, no, to I, that. Okay, let's not, let's not go back. Uh, yeah, that slide. was the brief that we asked rather than housing on this side, uh, make a school on this side. Um, you know, we just said, um, what are, you know, spaces of liberation? What are spaces of refusal? What are spaces of grief? Um, sites uh, of the kitchen, the porch, the corner, the street, the planet. Um, and then, you know, the various cities uh, that we proposed. Some people proposed like Seku Cook, Syracuse. So we wanted it to be, again, very loose and interpretive, almost poetic in terms of how people would understand it. And, you know, writers like Justin Davidson, you know, critiqued the show. And, you know, we're certainly welcome to critique about it needed to be more pragmatic. But I think both the curators as well as the participants said, well, it's not our job to resolve white oppression of black people. Like, why do we always have to come in and solve, come with a set of solutions for you to solve your oppression of us. Like we're not gonna do that labor. And why can't we be visionary and imaginary, utopic or dystopic or whatever? You know, that that's a liberation, right? No, those are those are really great questions. And and I mean, clearly given that only three percent of all architects in America are are licensed architects are are African American. Um, you said, Mabel, that the work is is the work of our white counterparts, right? that in, in many ways we have to kind of work with them to make these things, uh, to make the change mm -hmm. uh, that we're hoping to see. Yeah, yeah. I would just add that I think that each of us mm -hmm. also knew that um, we were not interested in rehearsing the tropes of blackness mm -hmm. um, and th those tropes of, of poverty, of degradation, of, you know, of objection. Um, you know, there was also, and maybe it was that review that Mabel was referring to, actually, I think it was a different one, you know, the, the first line of the, of the review referred to Pruitt Igo, because that is the image, if you will, of the ways in which Black people relate to, to architecture as being abject, and somehow Blackness is responsible for the failure of modernism, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for each of us, I think we thought, you know, and do think that no, that that is not what we're interested in. And um, I'll let Mabel take it back over. But I think this, mm -hmm. uh, my colleague um, Olale Kanjefus's work, really sort of points to you know this idea about futurity and you know uh, presenting something in this exhibition that no one had ever sort of seen before or had never quite seen this way in terms of thinking about black life and uh, black sustainability. Yeah, I'm reminded of that billboard. There are black people in the future, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> it's 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 almost uh, crazy that a statement like that has to be made, mm -hmm. but then it really does position um, us in uh, a kind of open-ended field, right? A field which mm -hmm. isn't which isn't subject to um, these abject histories like Pruitt Igo, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. And the fact that you know, I think it's very brave, um, Mario, um, of all of you, and 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 you, Mabel, of course, to 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 then also say that this is a call to action, right? That that there is no explicit call to action, but there are there's imagination, and mm -hmm. there are various uh, projects that speak to this future, um, while also connecting to our very rich history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And clearly, as, as Mario said, Lake's work speaks to that. And this is Crown Heights, his own neighborhood, right? A three channel projection, 
um, you know, and, and what happens when, you know, mobility, um, you know, comes with like what he would call mobility credits. Uh, and if you're poor, you, you can't, you sell your credits. Um, but then, you know, these, these emotionless, emotionless cars become, you know, other spaces um, for um, growing things, for, for selling seeds, for, you know, uh, uh, travels in the mind. Um, and so it becomes a kind of utopia out of, that sprouts out of um, this condition of environmental degradation. I also found this project quite generous in that um, it projects an image of the future that is rooted in blackness, but also very diverse. Yeah, absolutely. So, so and and it's, it's and, Crown Heights, right? It's Crown Heights, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's still mosques and synagogues and yeah, churches and, and people of all, yeah. you know, all different backgrounds living together, being creative together, yeah. and also it's like um, what he's successfully done here is painted this rich palette of a future that that isn't isn't really based on a kind of uh, white supremacist vision of the future right yeah absolutely. where where the the future that he's uh he's proposing um is still gritty and it's still layered and it's still it has a vocabulary that feels very urban and very familiar in the way that it's related to Blacks in urban space, mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, it feels completely um, optimistic and and renewable, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was I was very excited by this work. Um, our next uh, this is Walter Hood's Black Tower, Black Power, um, Oakland, California, um, and he used the Black Panther Party's ten point program um, to really rethink um, is amazing artery San Pablo Avenue um, in Oakland um, that connects to Emeryville and Berkeley, um, which is a site of, of many NGOs that attempt to alleviate poverty and so forth. And, you know, again, like Amanda, you know, thinking through this question of invention and innovation, and he uses to sort of generate the language of these towers of power, shall we say, um, you know, these, these the imprints of black innovation, these patents. Um, and so each one of the points um, creates a tower and then creates a kind of like black social space that is in fact vertical, right? And this in the face of all of the construction that's going on in downtown Oakland, given you know, all the money that's pouring in uh, with Silicon Valley um, in the East Bay. Uh, next, please. Um, this is Emmanuel Admasu's Immeasurability. Uh, which is a beautiful piece. The the tapestry in the black, the orange is actually the Atlantic Rift, which is the split, um, you know, between right, you know, these these the Africa and then and essentially in the New World. And when enslaved people crossed that, that's when they became black. And so when Emmanuel came from Ethiopia as a teenager, that's when he became black. Because in Ethiopia, he is, you know, who he is. <laughs> right? And there's a kind of metric associated, right, with blackness, right? Fun so that you can become fungible and exchangeable, right? And so that your life is rendered less than. And he was interested in these questions of boundaries, even in, in a city like Atlanta, where freeways cut through black communities um, like Auburn Avenue. And, you know, the ways in which the boundaries split between black and white in the cities were sometimes literally reinforced through walls, or now gentrification or moving those boundaries. And so in this amazing black that cauldron that you see in the middle are these blocks of the city, right? And then there are these Arduino motors that move back and forth that are moving this black sand that would have come out of the Atlantic Rift. And then all the walls are the immeasurable space of, of black life, the landscapes of Atlanta, which actually is quite green, and Waffle House, where folks hang, <laughs> where, where life can be found in the wee hours. So, you know, so that is the space of immeasurability, right? Not the planet, not the city, right? But this other realm. Mm. Next, please. And Jermaine Barnes' Spectrum of Blackness about Miami. He's from Chicago. Um, and, you know, living in Miami, Jermaine realized, whoa, wait, blackness is, is multilingual, right? And, and, and one register of that, for example, is food. So 
um, uh, Bayesian food, you have Jamaican, Dominican, right? Like, like people speak their culture, Panamanian, through what kinds of spices they use. So he has this kind of deconstructed spice rack, um, but also the kitchen and the porch uh, being spaces of black social life, regardless. Um, in the city um, and recognizing that Miami has had its own histories of continual displacement where you know many black and brown folks built what was Miami Beach were living in parts were pushed back inland uh, to set up these communities um, and now are being displaced by climate gentrification because that land you know that's further in is now valuable because it's not going to be subject to sea level rise right so it's this really both the meditation on both uh, displacement, but also, you know, cultural, cultural richness. And it's important to, to kind of acknowledge that blackness in Chicago is very different from blackness in Miami. And then mm -hmm. there, there is this broad spectrum of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's not monolithic. Absolutely. Reminds me of that. I don't know if you remember, Mabel, that Newsweek uh, uh, cover. Um, I think it was Newsweek that asked the question, what color is black? And there were all of these faces and all these different shades, right? So that, uh, you know, in a lot of ways relates to uh, Jermaine's project. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're running out of time. So I, I, you know, not that I want to kind of limit um, the comments on these other projects, but I'd love to give Mario enough time to speak yeah. uh, to his work. And yeah, and so I'll just say this is Sekou Cook, who looked um, at ways in which urban renewal and freeways destroy Black communities and net is this is uh, Mitch McEwen who explored uh, Republica, which was um, a, a, a fictional space imagined by Christina K. Robinson. And you know, this was what if that slave revolt in 1811 has succeeded? What kind of space would black people have made in New Orleans? Mm. Uh, next. Great, all right. And so uh, the city that I was asked to look at um, or that I selected to examine was uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, the, the project, which is called The Refusal of Space, examines the ways in which uh, Black people, not only in Nashville, but I would say across the diaspora, have had uh, to be and remain um, agile, uh, transformable, um, and creatively ad adapting, if you will, and uh, improvising uh, in space and in time. Um, and in Nashville, and particularly, I was interested in, uh, uh, in 1905, uh, because of uh, newly enacted uh, segregation law, a group of Black businessmen uh, found the first Black uh, trolley system there, which ran for, I think, a year or, or two years. Um, and this connected the various uh, uh, communities in, in Nashville from uh, the HBCUs of what was then Tennessee State to uh, different neighborhoods in, um, uh, in Nashville. Um, but because it relied on, uh, the cars relied on their batteries being charged by the local power company, which was white owned, um, uh, this black owned company was essentially sabotaged because they were given batteries that were badly, uh, badly charged. But the, the, the fact that they established, that they refused to accept the segregation laws and establish their own um, trolley line was something that I was interested in. Um, the other important period of Nashville's history that I was interested in, of course, was the civil rights, uh, protests, sit-ins, and, and marches by, led by students um, and the founders of, of SNCC in uh, the early 1960s, including a young uh, uh, John Lewis, who was a, a student at Fisk at the time. You know, other people like uh, Diane Nash, who um, you know, was a prominent leader. And the project is called The Refusal of Space um, because these students um, took what uh, I think was Cornell West calls, you know, the radi radical conditionists of, of the everyday and um, made this practice of, of liberation. You know, they took, it, they took an action, an action which was a spatial action, um, which gets to a, you know, a kind of uh, thing that I've been writing about is that liberation is a spatial practice. So in uh, looking at 
uh, and researching archival photographs and being able to, let's say, restitch time uh, in terms of the occurrences of these different events. Um, we constructed a digital model of these protests in the spring of 1961, um, uh, not only looking at the specific locations, but also looking at the movements um, that you see, a kind of spatial choreography. Um, and this animation, the film, as well as the archival images and archival footage um, was also a part of my installation at the moment. Um, so I'm just gonna let this, uh, this film that we made subsequently um, to the installation, let this continue to, uh, to play for a few more minutes. So while the research and the installation includes um, historic and archival images, we also wanted to look at the uh, demographic shifts that are occurring in Nashville um, and uh, the projected demographic shifts that are occurring as what, as what was once, um, let's say, property or areas of the city that were segregated and that were, were left for um, black people and people of color to live have now become the areas of the city which are being highly sought after and highly gentrified, causing a, you know, a further displacement of, uh, of black people in Nashville. And so here you see this timeline looking at um, uh, the historic displacement as well as the projected displacement into the year 2040. This drawing is a, a drawing that I call the DNA transcripts, um, which uh, looks at the archival photographs, our digital model, and um, using architectural language, um, develops a kind of choreography that then uh, gives way to this, uh, what I call a protest machine, which, which was on view at the MoMA, um, that included a black and co Confederate flag uh, a glass mural uh, of that transcript drawing and a thing that we call the black curtain, which opened and closed um, or breathed, if you will, as a kind of lung. Um, and these were um, wonderful photographs of the, of the piece taken by the uh, artist photographer, Chris Graves. Well, I mean, such a layered and, and rich uh, and deeply researched project, Mario. I mean, I think it's a really great place for us to, uh, to wrap up today. Um, I suppose I'm looking in the chat for questions, if there are any questions. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, what are the next steps? Um, it's clear that the exhibition is just a kind of starting point and there's such a depth of knowledge and, and uh, community that's been built around this, which I think is in many ways almost uh, more important um, than the presentation of individual works. Um, but I, I, I suppose, you know, what, you know, how do you begin to evaluate something like this? And then how do you begin to kind of build upon it and in some ways normalize it? 
Um, well, maybe then that uh, this is an appropriate closing slide. This is the manifesting statement of the Black Reconstruction uh, Collective. Um, and as I mentioned early, the, the BRC was, was born out of uh, 10 of us who came together um, after being commissioned to produce works for the show. But the statement, I think, really um, speaks to the future of the BRC and the BRC's mission towards dismantling systemic white supremacy, but also to supporting um, others who are doing the, the work, if you will, of a continued reconstruction or the work of, of liberatory practices. And so this manifesting statement, um, uh, which actually was not commissioned by, by MoMA, but something that we did on our own. Um, and then um, uh, MoMA uh, requested if we could include it in the, in the exhibition was actually the first thing that one would see crossing the, the bridge at the third floor um, to enter the gallery. And um, it is a, uh, I suppose a, a kind of manifesto um, for the future um, and for the future of thinking about the, the work of, of constructing liberation. Fantastic. Um, I'm just looking here in the chat to see if there are any questions. Uh, um, I suppose the only question is, is pretty much the one that I've asked you about what comes next. Um, but th this has been a fantastic hour spent with you guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mabel and Mario. Um, and of course, I look forward to continued conversations uh, as we're all colleagues up at Columbia University. Um, and, uh, you know, wondering um, about how this particular moment in time now begins to, to feed, to continue to feed uh, other exhibitions and other um, acquisitions by museums uh, around the world, et cetera. So, um, Thank you so much for your work and uh, your ideas uh, and your contributions to the field. Um, and, and I'll just add, I just dropped in the chat. Um, we have a Coursera based on the show, an online course that you know has in-depth work about each project um, and a, a huge range of material. Um, and it's uh, reimagining blackness in architecture. So please check that out as well as the field guide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucy, uh, I was just going to say um, that um, we'd like for everyone to be on the lookout for work and projects coming up from the BRC um, over the next two years. The BRC is working on a project called Unmonument. Um, uh, and uh, BRC, this will be announced later. Um, uh, we'll be starting a, um, I wanna, don't want to call it necessarily a BRC prize, um, but we will be initiating our grants program, whereby we will be re-granting to, um, to other individuals and entities. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Mabel and Mario. Um, everyone, before you go, I just want to mention that next week, uh, my co-host Glenn Adamson will be in conversation on June 9th with John Hope. Um, so please join us then. This has been Design and Dialogue. Thank you so much, Mabel and Mario. Great. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.